shoulder dislocation uh, we will be discussing about shoulder dislocations shoulder dislocation is a very common thing that you see in your practice and you will notice that it is a problem because that can occur in small children also and elderly population also so you must understand uh, how it is managed how it is primarily treated and what we can do to prevent episodes of dislocations later so the chances of uh, dislocation of the shoulder is more in young patients so the chances of dislocation is higher in low age patient as compared to a higher age patient so it's the chances of dislocations occurring is more with adolescent or young adults with the same amount of injury as compared to a adult patient also the dislocations can occur in elderly so they can occur in patients who are 60 70 years of age but then the morphology or the pattern of injury is different if a uh, shoulder dislocation occurs in a young patient it is most commonly due to a labral tear labral injury uh, which is also called as a bank fracture and we will uh, come on to various uh, morphological features of uh, dislocation later on but if the pa the patient's dislocation is occurring at a higher age let's say 60 and above then it is a high chance that it is associated not with a labral tear but with a rotator cuff tear so pure rotator cuff tendon tear can also cause dislocations so you may have patient who has having a repeated episodes of dislocation because of a rotator cuff injury with a intact labrum this is a very important concept so if it is a old patient you must put more attention on the cuff injury as compared to a labral tear now dislocation can occur in variety of uh, variety of causes uh, injuries like sports injuries two wheeler accidents unusual activities epilepsies uh, things like that so uh, you need to uh, see the first uh, thing as a surgeon as an orthopedic surgeon if the patient presents to you is to do an x ray because occasionally these dislocations may be accompanied by fracture so every time a patient come to you with dislocation don't assume that it is a dislocation get an x ray because many a times this dislocation can be accompanied by a fracture also so you need to rule out an x ray first and then you can reduce by a number of methods which are described so there are a number of methods which are described that you all very well know and uh, you can reduce it with any of these methods now once you reduce the dislocation uh, it is imperative to immobilize the patient now the position of immobilization is controversial so many many uh, surgeons will immobilize in uh, internal location many will uh, improvise in uh, immobilize in neutral and some will uh, immobilize in external location so it is still it is not clear but i would usually recommend you to uh, mobile immobilize in about a neutral position not a full internal or full external position position there is a paper in ana uh, in arthroscopy journal which states that if you immobilize in external rotation the healing rates are better so but it is it is still not proven so i'll just recommend that you immobilize the patient in a uh, neutral position for about 3 weeks or so this is only true for a first episode of dislocation so if the patient is having dislocation recurrent then there is no point of immobilizing the patient every time after the dislocation so because if there is dislocation injury that is a labral injury has to heal it will heal with the first time and if it is occurring second time it is almost pretty sure that the injury has not healed and it has a very low chances of healing there so that is very important so if a patient is having a single episode of dislocation he has some chances of healing whereas if it has two or more than two episodes of dislocation there are almost practically nil chances of healing the chances of redislocation as i told you is more with low age so if the patient's age is less then the chances of redislocation are high and you need to do, be more aggressive with these sort of patients and do more aggressive kind of a surgery for these patients so if the patient is like adolescent 15 year 20 years then very high rates of dislocation if the patient is about middle age and little bit less and about 40 or so if even if you do a regular procedures the redislocation rates will not be too much now i'll i'll, I'll ask you a question yes. so patient comes to you with a recurrent episodes of shoulder dislocation what is your investigation of choice what what is the investigation that you would like to do if you want to do only one investigation yeah, I will do an X-ray first. X-ray is for an acute episode of dislocation. So, if the patient comes to you with an acute episode, you definitely have to do an X-ray. But this patient is a 
patient of recurrent uh, episodes of dislocation in his cell let's say is about 8 to 10 episodes of dislocation so far so what is one investigation which is a investigation scan to know the bone loss so uh, actually uh, both are fine ct and mri but i would uh, i would place ct as a better investigation because in a patient with a recurrent dislocation what i am worried more is about the bone loss and the bone loss can be categorically uh, uh, evaluated on the basis of ct scan so that is very important so if the patient has having recurrent episode dislocation ideally you should do both ct scan and an mri scan but if you have to do one then you have to do a ct scan now this ct scan should be done with special sequences with 3d reconstruction and you would ideally like to reduce or subtract the humeral head from the so limited CTs. cuts limited cuts and you have to subtract the humeral head so that you have an end on view of the glenoid okay. so after this ct what i want is an end on view of glenoid so that i can actually assess that how much bone loss is there because on the basis of the bone loss i would place my decision which procedure or which surgical intervention i want to perform so that is very important mri is equally important because mri will tell you a lot of other findings like uh, labral tears and there are some other findings so we'll just focus on important morphological findings which are there which can be seen in patients of recurrent shoulder dislocation so if the patient is uh, uh, having a dislocation shoulder we need to do an mri scan and mri will have a different different findings in different different patients so there are some set sort of uh, mri findings or mri pictures that you must know so labrum tear is one so this labral tear can be anterior or posterior so you can have a anterior labral tear you can have a posterior okay. labral tear then you may have a superior labral tear anterior and posterior to bicep that is called as a slab tear occasionally in these patients you may have a global or a pen labral tear that means the whole 360 degree of labrum is torn that sort of injuries can also be seen now what is a bank cut tear bank cut is only the labrum is torn and the anterior Exactly. So, Bankart is basically an anterior inferior labral tear. So, Bankart lesion by definition is a labral tear, anterior inferior in position. Now, if these sort of anterior inferior tears are not addressed on time, they will land into what is called as an Elpsa lesion. Elpsa is an anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, and this occurs due to untreated Bankart lesion. So, Bankart lesion is untreated. This and both labrum and the Bankart complex will migrate on the medial aspect of the glenoid. and thereby causing what is called as an elpsa lesion so whole of this complex of the labrum and the capsule will migrate on the medial aspect of glenoid tank so this is very very important this is called as an elpsa lesion besides this there are two more uh, lesions that you should be aware of one is called as a hagel lesion hagel is basically a reverse of labrum so here the injury is on the humeral side so it is called as a humeral avulsion of the glenoid ligament so dislocation is from the capsule is dislocated from the glenoid from the humeral head as compared to the bankart or labral tear where it is from the glenoid side and here the telltale sign is uh, on mri you will have some pictures and on on the arthroscopic picture the capsule will not be seen like a like a parda so it will just go down and you will be able to see muscle fibers muscle of the subscapula so that is a very classical picture of a hagel lesion then you can have a reverse hagel lesion so you will up, up, uh, hagel lesion on the posterior part of the joint so that is uh, the capsule is avulsed from the posterior part of the humeral head that is called as a reverse hagel lesion then you can have bankart lesion with a bone component so that is called as a bony bankart lesion now bony bankart lesion is of two types one with an actual bone fragment and one with a bone loss So these are two different scenarios. What, what is the difference between the two? Uh, bony bankart is one piece of bone is attached to the labrum. Exactly. And bony loss means labrum is there but bone piece is not there. Exactly. So there. important thing is that if you want to calculate the bone loss, if there is a bone fragment, you need to calculate it in a different way. So let's suppose your glenoid is about seventy five percent width and twenty five percent. absent and let's suppose there is about 10% of bone which is there on the on the labral side so then you have an effective bone loss of around 15% as compared to the attrition bone loss if you have a glenoid which is around 75% then 
then the bone loss is actually 25 percent. So the bone fragment which is attached to the labrum can be repaired back to the original glenoid and that will actually recreate or re, uh, rebuild the bone loss. So whenever you take a call of doing any bony surgery then you have to take it out accordingly. So if there is a bone fragment and if after reducing the bone fragment you get a complete circle then there is not much of a bone loss. A little bit of bone loss may be there at the surfaces but then it is not that severe enough. So if you are able to uh, repair those. So if there is a bony fracture, bone loss with a fracture and you have a bone fragment on the anterior aspect of the glenoid, then you can actually repair it without doing an additional bony procedure to correct the bone loss. Whereas if there is an attrition bone loss and the, there is only labrum on the anterior side, then whatever it is, it is full and final. So then you may have to do something for the bone loss per se. So these are the two kinds of a bone loss situations that is very important. Now this kind of bone fractures kind of situation is more common in acute settings or primary fractures. Whereas the attrition is after maybe many episodes, 25, 30, 50 episodes of dislocation. So this you must be very well aware of. If you have a bone loss fragment which is large, then I would recommend a technique of a double row fixation in which I will do a medial row with a regular anchor and lateral knotless on the glenoid with a knotless. So that is called as a double row fixation of the glenoid fracture okay that is the best technique if you have a good size junk of the bone loss threat so that is one if you have attrition bone loss and the attrition bone loss is more than 15 percent the procedure of my choice will be to do a bone block procedure that means you are recreating the bone loss with any kind of a bone so you can use a number of uh, things like you can use an iliac crest, you can use a coracoid, you can use a scapular spine, you can use anything to basically re recreate that bone loss fragment. As far as the fixation is concerned, now the trend of fixation is more towards using a fiber tape encirclage as compared to a screw for this bone block because of some problems which are associated with the screw heads. So the fixation of the screw is a relatively uh, poor fixation. The chances of non-union, malunion and uh, uh, implant failure is high. And we all know that bolts, this is basically, uh, this is a, what Pascal Boileau call as bolt. So bolt fixation is actually stronger than a screw fixation. Bolt has two ends and in between connection. So bolt fixation is stronger than screw fixation. So nowadays, if you are doing a bone block procedure or a bone recreation procedure, we are more towards refixing it with a fiber tape encirclage or some sort of bolts with buttons with a connected fiber tape as compared to screw. Because they will have a better fixation, lesser chances of non-union, malunion and implant failure and lesser chances of follow-up arthritis in the patient. So, because whenever you are doing any kind of a bone block or bone restoration procedure, you stand a high chance of developing osteoarthritis in future because you are creating an extra surface. So if you are doing that, then the patient do stand a high chance of having osteoarthritis. And to prevent those, this osteoarthritis, you need to do some things. Number one, ideally you should close the capsule if you can repair the labrum and can make the bone fragment extra articular that is the great thing that you can do and as I told you that avoid using screw heads because occasionally these screw heads may be prominent and they may cause loss or damage to the cartilage surface of the humerus. So that is one thing that you must take care of. So that's why now out of all these three the recent modality of my choice is a scapular spine because it is from the same side you don't have to harvest from another side it has it will not hamper the normal anatomy of the anterior shoulder as if you take a rubber coin with a bone uh, with a sling that is if you take a short head of biceps and the conjoint tendon along with a coracoid like doing an arthroscopic lethargy then you are uh, disorienting or uh, deforming the anterior part of the the anatomy of the anterior part of the so with using the scapular spine we are not disturbing the anterior glenoid or anterior shoulder anatomy it is a small fragment, it has got good uh, healing rates and you can repair the labrum and the capsular complex very nicely over it. So, how at present this is my 
graph choice for a bone loss which is up to 25% because this the only negative point of this graph is a relatively smaller size as compared to coracoid and iliac so in very very few scenarios you will have a bone loss which is which is more than 25% and then you might consider using either a iliac crest because iliac crest you have a doubt you can take as big as possible yeah. so you can just you iliac crest you can take a very large bone chunk and fix it up and uh, coracoid also so uh, again if it is only if it is more than 25% then i will think of something doing doing something else than doing a scapular spine uh, procedure Spine, scapular spine bone graft is now at present uh, my graft choice if I am treating a patient with a uh, bone loss which is less than 25% So uh, and the other things it is easy to harness graft mm -hmm. and it is on the same side So you just have to pay, place a small 3 to 4 cm incision on the posterior aspect of the shoulder Expose the cervical spine and just take about a 2 cm graft from the place And it, it has got a uh, cancellous surface so it heals also well one very important study was done uh, with respect to bone, um, bone grafts and it was said that larger grafts have a higher yeah, non-union yeah. loss. So nowadays it is said that if you take a smaller graft it is better. Uh, and another very, very good study shows that the rates of failure of the implants in letargy is more if the letargy is done without a bone loss. So there is a group of surgeons which will recommend letargy for all the patients irrespective of the bone loss and there were two, uh, two groups, one was, was without bone loss like say 15% bone loss or 20% bone loss and one without a bone loss. So those patients in which letargy was done without a bone loss, those patients actually have a higher rate of complications which includes non-union, malunion and implant failure of the screws and the bone resorption of the fragment per se. So ideally also if there is not a bone loss, you should refrain from doing a procedure with a bone, uh, with a bone block because that will actually cause a more, relatively more complication rate and relatively more reabsorption of the bone plaque. So in all other cases in which the bone loss is I will say less than 15%, you can safely go ahead with doing a regular labral and webcard repair along with such procedure as needed in the desired thing. One thing you must read is about engaging and non-engaging hill sex lesion and uh, recent uh, definition is of about on track and off track hill sex lesion. This is more theoretical but you should know it from the decision making standpoint. Uh, at present in clinical practice I would do around 80 to 90 percent of my bank card tears with a rep research. So I am more of a more of a doing more so it is no harm in doing more procedures to make it more stable so i would do more ramp suggests as compared to a solitary bank art or a lateral procedures and these all patients need to be mobilized for a period of about a month either you do a bank art ramp or a bone block procedure and here you can mobilize them after a period of a month okay any questions sir uh, in case of multiple dislocations Plication is how often should we do or we should? So, plication, the inferior capsular plication is done in those cases in which the labrum is normal. So, that is a very rare scenario. So, most of the time the labrum will be torn, and if you do a good labral repair along with we need to do an inferior to superior shift, and if you do that, mostly there will not be a problem, and you don't need to do a plication. The plication is done in MDI patients, the multi ligamentous, multi -ligamentous injury or ligamentous laxity patients or a multi-directional instability patients, then you can do a actually citation on the inferior and anterior sites. So that is but that is not a routinely done procedure uh, grossly. And uh, sir, uh, if multiple dislocations are occurring, uh, so what should be the procedure for that? So that is a bone loss. So you need to you need to evaluate in the inverted pair how much is the bone loss. And as I have told you, if the bone loss is less than 15, you do a regular uh, bank card with amplicity. 15 to 25 you do a, I will do a scapular spine bone block or any kind of a bone block procedure and more than 25 you can do either a coracoid or a iliac crest bone graft as per your choice. Thank you.